Diaz. We um, we will get started in just a second. Uh, we are just waiting for folks to come on in. But we have a wonderful group of panelists here with us today, and I'm so excited for uh, everybody to engage in conversation with our special guests. Um, and a big thank you to Congresswoman Barragan for being with us bright and early here this morning. Nine oh two a.m. Mountain Time. Uh, so I will go ahead and uh, and kick us off. Uh, buenos dias. Uh, so my name is Gabe Vasquez. I'm the founder of the Nuestra Tierra Conservation Project. I'm a city councilor in the town of Las Cruces, New Mexico, uh, which is a border city about thirty-five miles away from the U.S.-Mexico border. Member with the Outdoor Alliance, and I'm the co-creator of the New Mexico Outdoor Equity Fund. Um, I am coming to you this morning from the lands of the Jornada Mogollon and the Piro Manso Tiwa. And we have a one queued up for you all today. We'll be talking outdoor and outdoor access. And we have two very special guests with us, Congresswoman Nanette Barragan and Senator Martin Heinrich, respectively of California, Mexico. Uh, the reason I'm so excited for today's conversation is because over the last year during the pandemic, We've been talking a lot more on outdoor access and outdoor equity because we've realized that the outdoors are a place of healing. They're a transformational place of learning. And especially for young people, uh, they give us hope. They give us mental health. They give us physical health. Uh, and they give us experiences that last a lifetime. But you have to be able to access these special place and have opportunities in order to enjoy that special part uh, of both public lands and state parks and local parks and so we'll be talking about two initiatives today, the Outdoors for All Act and the Outdoor Future Initiative. The folks on this panel today are not just talking about outdoor equity, they're doing something about it. Uh, the future of climate, the future of conservation, uh, I believe will be built on equitable access and opportunity for all as the foundation of how we get there. So I wanna thank everybody who's on this call today uh, or on this webinar today uh, that has also been involved in outdoor equity issues. Uh, California is a state that is rich in organizers. It is rich in culture. Um, it is rich in people who believe in social and environmental justice. And I know many of us, uh, many of the folks joining us today are from California. Uh, and I couldn't be more proud of the network uh, of organizers and young people and organizations who are all helping to make um, outdoor access and a reality. I especially wanna thank today the Outdoor Alliance, the Continental Divide Trail Coalition, the Nuestra Tierra Conservation Project, Latino Outdoors, the sponsors for today, Patagonia, Hydro Flask, and Kodiak, and of course, our special guests for joining us today. Uh, throughout today's webinar, uh, we will be, um, we, we do encourage audience members to participate in the conversation. So as questions come up for our panelists, uh, please do feel free to respond in the chat box. Um, I'll go ahead and start by introducing some of our special guests today, um, and I'll start with Ms. Gavacha Moreno. So Ms. Gavacha Moreno is a first-generation Mexican-American and outdoor equity advocate. She's an improvement consultant and a multidisciplinary storyteller. She serves as the Associate Equity Director for the Nuestra Tierra Conservation Project, where she's involved in the creation of policy and campaigns to protect the stolen lands we share and make the outdoors more equitable. She is a founding member of the Outdoor Future Initiative. Uh, you may be no stranger to Mr. Jose Gonzalez, who was, the, who was the founder and the former executive director of Latino Outdoors, an organization born and bred in California. Experienced educator as a K-12 uh, public education teacher. He's an environmental education advisor and outdoor education instructor and coordinator. Uh, he's been featured just about everywhere, right? Especially on Instagram, where he makes some of the funnest and coolest memes, so please follow Jose at Jose Bilingue when you have a chance. Um, but he's been featured in High Country News and Outside Magazine, uh, Latino USA, etc. cetera. Uh, but just as importantly, he's also been involved in policy development, uh, working with the White House Council on Environmental Quality, the US Department of Interior and the National Park Service. And he's a founding member of the Outdoor Future Initiative. Last but not least, Ms. Teresa Martinez is a lifelong outdoor recreationist. She used to work for the Appalachian Trail Conversi uh, Con Conservancy, and she's now the executive director and the co-founder of the Continental Divide Trail Coalition. She serves on the Trail Leadership Council of the Partnership for the National Trail System, and she served as the chair of the Federal Advisory Committee 
to aid the U.S. Forest Service in the development of the Pacific Northwest National Scenic Trail. She's also one of the board chairs for the Next 100 Coalition and is a founding member of the Outdoor Initiative. Uh, with that, I want to go ahead and kick it off to our Congresswoman um, from California, Ms. Nanette Barragan, for an introduction to kick us off today. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Gabe, uh, so much for all those introductions. And um, I'm in Washington, D.C. I love, do love New Mexico and do miss my California. Uh, thanks for having me to here today. Um, and I want to thank the Outdoor Alliance California for hosting this forum. It's an honor to be with you. Urban parks and green spaces are crucial for the health and quality of our life, of our communities. This could not have been more apparent than during the pandemic last year. We saw the important role parks play as a, as a place where we could go to walk or bike for exercise and safely socialize with friends and family. We also saw the disparities between communities that have access to a park and those do, who do not. Far too many people in low-income communities and communities of color lack the same access to green outdoor space as people in other communities. For example, a survey done by the LA County Department of Parks and Recreation found that 51% of residents live more than half a mile from a park. This inequality is even more glaring in my congressional district. While the average amount of parkland in the county is 3.3 acres per 1,000 residents, the city of Compton in my district has only 0.6 it's 0.6 acres of parkland per 1,000 residents. In contrast, the city of Malibu, uh, upper class, well-to-do, has three times the median household income of Compton, and it has 55.5 acres of parkland per 1,000 residents. These disparities are all too common throughout this country. They highlight the importance of my bill, the Outdoors for All Act, it establishes the National Parks Outdoor Legacy Partnership Program and creates a dedicated source of funding for urban parks in underserved communities. With these investments, we can improve access to urban parks and make meaningful progress on urban park equity. These parks can bring people together, protect our communities from flooding and help keep our communities and cities cool. They can also help create new economic development and employment opportunities in neighborhoods that need them. At the beginning of July, I was able to get the Outdoors for All Act included as an, an amendment in the INVEST Act, a bill that invests in our transportation infrastructure. As the House and the Senate negotiate our infrastructure investments, I will be pushing hard uh, to make sure the Outdoors for All Act is included as a part of any final package. With the Outdoors for All Act, we have a tremendous opportunity we can partner with local governments to identify and create new green spaces. We can shrink the disparities in public park access that exist by income level and race. And in doing so, we will create a new opportunities for economic revitalization and healthier, more vibrant communities. I'm looking forward to our conversation today. Thank you for having me and all those in attendance. Thank you so much, Congresswoman. And, and thank you and your staff uh, for getting this important legislation uh, through Congress during a time when it's very tough, I understand, to pass legislation, uh, finding vehicles in which um, to prioritize these bills that are so important to our communities um, is so appreciated and important. Um, I did fail to mention one thing, and that we are in the middle of Latino Conservation Week. And uh, the, today's discussion is really at the heart and the center of what Latino Conservation Week. So I want to give a uh, to the Hispanic Access Foundation and Latino Outdoors uh, for making that possible. Uh, with that, we'll go ahead and start uh, with a question from Mr. Jose Gonzalez. Jose, go ahead. Great. Thank you so much, Gabe. Um, and hope everything's coming loud and clear. Uh, first of all, I wanted to say, Congresswoman, uh, thank you, first of all, as always, for your service as an elected official and all the work that you do to ensure more outdoor access for all, especially here in California. Um, to everybody else, saludos. I am calling you all from traditional, ancestral, stolen and unceded lands of the Nisenan, Southern Maidu, Miwok, and among many others in what is at the moment Sacramento uh, here in California. And I wanted to add a quick note and then have a question for you, Congresswoman. Um, I grew up in the Central Valley of California uh, where Yosemite 
was about two hours away. And yet as a kid, I didn't really have a concept of, of it existing as a national park. It wasn't until college that I finally made my way there. Uh, made, my, made my way there. And it reminded me of the reality that access is not as, as easy, right? As just uh, knowing that something may be within two hours away. But what does that mean, not just in transportation and knowing about it and having a sense of welcome and inclusion, and of course, actually of um, accessing the benefits of those experiences. And you mentioned a little bit about obviously the challenge in the, uh, in the LA area and how a lot of that region has been described as a park that has many park poor communities, um, even as work is underway, both with, with urban park equity, as well as um, state and federal public lands. I mean, you get St. Gabriel Mountains is a classic example in, in the area. So my question is, as you were describing uh, the potential of this work, if you could say a little bit more about that, what if I am a kid that's growing up in LA, right in the LA region right now in California? What does that future look like for me 10 years out, you know, 30 years out and more uh, as a family for whom these are new experiences? Um, how would you paint that, that picture and why does this matter to you personally? Well, thank you, Jose. You're absolutely right that the availability of access to public lands and urban parks isn't easy. Now this issue is personal to me because I was the youngest of 11 kids and in a family that was struggling to make ends meet, um, I had to get on a bus to get to a park. So for me to go to baseball practice, little league practice, I had to get on a bus and there was no park within half a mile of where I lived and this is in Los Angeles in a community that, you know, had not far away, uh, the gangs were there. And so my out was to have to get on a bus. And can you imagine as a child, how hard that is, especially in today's day and age. So escaping concrete and asphalt for the green grass of a city park for little league practice meant the world to me. It was literally a breath of fresh air. So every kid should have that opportunity to connect with the outdoors, be it trees and grass or a baseball diamond or a soccer pitch or a field. It can create a sense of place and belonging in addition to providing significant health benefits. Unfortunately, far too often, uh, economic disadvantaged communities or communities of color, um, parks are considered a privilege um, and they shouldn't be. We have the potential to expand access to parks to these communities and the outdoors for all can help do that. Um, there is an example in my district that shows me the promise of what is possible. Earlier this month, I joined park advocates and community leaders in Southgate, uh, uh, have a big Latino community for the groundbreaking of uh, urban orchard, um, a community park that will be built on a post-industrial land located along the Los Angeles River. The park will include an education garden, fruit orchid, uh, orchards, um, walking trails, a community center, a wetland, and it will display community-based artwork. It also um, will host the Los Angeles uh, Conservation Corps in the future, creating youth employment opportunities. So when you think about a, a dedicated urban parks funding, we can create more park projects like the one I just mentioned in underserved communities in Los Angeles and LA County around the country. <laughs> And we can imagine where kids are able to walk to a local park, go out and play and um, get all the benefits of being in a park um, and the socialization there as well. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Congresswoman. And thank you, Jose, uh, for your question as well. We'll move on to now to Ms. Gabacha Moreno uh, for a question for our Congresswoman. Muchas gracias, Gabe. Um, Thank you, and thank you everyone who's in attendance. I'm joining live today from Ancestral Pueblo and Jicari Apache, also known as Santa Fe, New Mexico. Uh, Congresswoman, I also, first of all, wanna thank you for your leadership and your great commitment to equity. Um, when I first moved to the United States from Mexico, I actually had the privilege of living in a suburb of Los Angeles, in Laverne to be specific. I lived in this, beautiful American dream home that my grandma's brother had built over 50 years of being a hard worker um, and being super disciplined. Outside of my door, I had this small wilderness park that for the six months that I lived there, really just watched me grow. It watched me 
study under the trees and rehearse dances on the open grass. And it also helped me keep it together as a refuge while I was undergoing a rather isolating transition to life in this country. I literally have no, had no friends. So I had just had the few people in my family and that part was kind of like a big, uh, big friend for me at that time. Um, and I honestly took it for granted almost. Um, but then I, I gained a lot of perspective when I made my next move. I moved to another big city, I moved to New York. And after a semester of overpaying rent at the school dorms in Manhattan, I moved to Brooklyn. And again, I had the privilege of having a park outside my door. Uh, but this time the park was a little different. Um, it was definitely in a more urbanized area, uh, but it was definitely more concrete than living plants. And it was also uh, going through this rat infestation. So it wasn't a very welcoming place. Um, but luckily in New York City, I had the privilege of the transportation infrastructure, right? So whenever I wanted to go to another green space, I could hop on a train and be there. And I know that that's not true of most places. And I know that many kids are left with no choice of a healthy green space to visit. Uh, but I'm getting to the fact that two years after I moved away from that neighborhood, I came back for a dinner party and I realized the whole neighborhood had been gentrified and the park was more lively and more green and the rats were nowhere to be found. But alongside with that, also I didn't see the, you know, the lady who used to sell the elotes and the gentleman that used to sell the tamales um, or the corner bodega was also gone. So, um, you know, clearly new communities bring their changes to these otherwise forgotten areas. Um, and I, I wonder how much faster that could happen when we start making these areas better to begin with, right? So my question to you is, as the Outdoors for All Act starts supporting urban neighborhoods and their, and their green spaces, uh, how are we going to avoid their gentrification and the displacement of their communities? Thank you uh, for uh, the question and for sharing your story. Um, I agree with you that as we bring new amenities to communities that haven't, that haven't had them, that we need to make sure people with limited incomes who live in the community are not priced out of renting or owning a home. But we should not be afraid of trying to improve the quality of life for people in these communities. We just don't want them pushed out when their neighborhoods become nicer and more desirable. So to make sure that community improvements do not have unintended consequences, we need local governments to use what are called anti-displacement strategies for park projects or any other amenity that will improve the community and might raise the cost of housing. This means that in the early stages of park development in low-income communities and neighborhoods, local planning agencies need strong public outreach to include the vision of the people who live there as they design the project. In addition, planners should work closely with housing and community development agencies and advocates to spot challenges and solutions around possible gentrification. An example of this um, is in the LA Regional Open Space and Affordable Housing Collaborative. It works to promote access to both affordable housing and to open space. It's important that we not accept um, conventional thinking that it must be a choice you know, between affordable housing and open space. Uh, when we make a neighborhood nicer and provide a better quality of life, the people who have lived there for generations and built a community should not have to leave. Certainly not the man on the corner that sells those tamales or um, the people that you know bring that culture there. Um, so every person, uh, regardless of race, income, zip code, should all have access to a park, to affordable housing, quality transportation, and clean air and water. So our goal should be to make every neighborhood desirable and at the same time thinking about how to keep folks there. So thank you so much for that question. Thank you, Congresswoman, and thank you, Galacha, for that wonderful question. Um, living in New Mexico, I can tell you uh, the uh, cost of housing, the cost of rent, 
uh, between a community like Santa Fe and a community like Las Cruces are completely uh, different in, in terms of what's affordable. Uh, but I'll also say, um, it, Ms. Gavacha, in your background, you have the Oregon Mountain Desert Peaks National Monument. Um, that's a national monument that our community, uh, majority Mexican American community in Las Cruces uh, fought so hard uh, to bring to our people and to our community um, that was designated through the Antiquities Act uh, from former President Obama that created uh, almost nearly half a million acres of accessible public land um, to, a, 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 I would say, a very underserved community. And so um, there's, there continues to be opportunities for more of these spaces. Um, I know like the San Gabriel Mountains, uh, which the LA community fought for for so long, right, to be able to bring um, some of that uh, to communities that, that truly deserve access to these places. And so um, and there's so many different things that we can do at the, at the federal level uh, to bring green spaces to folks like the Outdoors for All Act. Um, with that, I will pass it over to Ms. Teresa Martinez. Muchas gracias, Gabe, and buenos dias, everyone. And um, I would like to tell you that I am uh, Teresa Martinez. I'm calling in or zooming in from Santa Fe, New Mexico as well. And I'm on the stolen lands of the Hickory and uh, Apache and Tiwa people. And thank you, Congresswoman Baragon. Um, we definitely appreciate your leadership. And I, and I would like to kind of take this conversation a little bit differently because, um, you know, I am a, I'm a Mexican American woman living here in the United States. And our family has been originated from Texas, originally from Nueva Leon many, 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 many generations ago. And so, you know, my, my origin story is slightly different. My parents growing up in the 60s in Austin, Texas, you know, they, they taught, when, when they had my brother and I, they, they didn't teach us Spanish. They didn't want us speaking with an accent. They wanted us to be American and to really show up as American. And so in many ways, while yes, we made tamales at Christmas and we made enchiladas and I learned how to make tortillas from my mother and my grandmother and everything else, um, there was a lot of parts that we assimilated. We also ate a lot of cheeseburgers, so, <laughs> and spaghetti, um, uh, sometimes even with uh, tortillas. But um, <laughs> I do want to share that um, a little bit about me and that when I was 18, I, I actually grew up in Virginia. My dad worked for the State Department. So we traveled also all around the world and always came back to Virginia. And um, I ended up going to Virginia Tech. And I actually took my first steps on the Appalachian Trail my first weekend of school at Virginia Tech. And I didn't know what the AT was. I just saw a flyer aging myself. I saw a flyer in a dorm room. There was no internet back then saying volunteers were needed. And it meant, for me, it meant getting off of campus. So I talked my roommate into going with me. And um, we were part of a small crew of volunteers out for the day of maintenance. And I quickly learned exactly what the AT was. And when I learned that if I turned left, I could go to Georgia, I turned right, I could go to Maine. My, my entire life changed in that instant. And I didn't, I didn't even know something like that existed. I didn't know that I could do work on it. I didn't know that, that I could be a part of a community like that. And it began a love affair that I've had with long trails ever since. And I'm privileged to have had an over 30 year career stewarding some of the most iconic places in our country. And I'm incredibly privileged these days to support the stewardship of the Continental Divide Trail and a landscape that, co that connects across communities and cultures and protects the major watershed of the North American continent. But since my early days, I've also been privileged that even though most of my supervisors and mentors have been white males, they've also been amazing examples of allies who have always encouraged me to recognize more in myself than I did at the time and to continue to grow and strengthen my skills. But it was very far and few between that I had someone who looked like me as a mentor. But today I am serving as an executive director and, I, and it is not lost on me the role I get to play. Um, so in spite of all that privilege um, for most of my career, I, I also have to admit that I didn't feel like I always belonged. Um, I always knew when I walked into a room that I was the one who looked differently and oftentimes heads would turn and look at me when I walk into a room, especially in Southwest Virginia where I did spend a lot of my, my career. Um, and so in spite, of, in spite of having this great ally community around me, I also realized that growing up because of my parents' experiences and their generation um, and just working in a predominantly white profession, I assimilated into a community that left me disconnected from significant aspects of my culture and the aspects of my person that make me who I am. And I'm now, just now, just now, realizing how for my generation, a process of assimilation into this culture, this more white dominant culture has been central to my work in conservation. And it's been a great thing. So 
it's great, but that impact has had a significant impact on me and as a human, and I'm starting to strip that away. And it hasn't been until my work with Next 100 Coalition and the Outdoor Future and my friends and colleagues on this phone or on the Zoom call and also those listening today that I finally feel more comfortable in my role and in leaning into my identity as a Latina and even more as a leader. And I find that strength in the collective community to break even more barriers, create more opportunities and fight the systems that continue to show up in our conservation work. So my hope is that the Outdoor Future Initiative, the Outdoors for All legislation will create more opportunities for all of us, especially people who look like me, to experience places that change their life and open up new horizons that provide space, freedom and safety to not have to assimilate into a culture, but rather that people can show up as who they are and they can serve as the next generation of stewards of our natural places and give them the courage and passion to reimagine what conservation can look like. So my question for you is how do you see the legislation like the Outdoors for All and hopeful legislation like the Outdoor Future Act and other outdoor equity programs happening across the country, providing these opportunities for all young people, especially from our communities of color. Well, thank you, Teresa, for your work and dedication to building a more inclusive conservation movement. Uh, your story uh, resonated a lot, uh, whether it's walking into a room and looking differently, uh, whether it's our parents uh, not uh, growing up, the concern about teaching us you know, Spanish. Uh, so I completely understand uh, when you told your story. I, you know, believe that through our efforts to create more urban parks and make our national parks more accessible to young people of color, that we're changing the face of conservation and the pressures that you talk about. You know, just this week, we're celebrating Latino Conservation Week, the role of the Latino community in protecting our open spaces and in being outdoors. Um, one other thing I just want to uh, mention before I forget something that when you were talking, I thought about, and that is making sure that we're getting um, Latinos, Latinas, and people of color appointed to local, you know, government parks commissions, that they're being picked for the California Coastal Commission, right, to have our representation and our voice there to bring our perspective and our experience to the table, but then also serve as the role models uh, for our children when they see us there. Um, be able to know that this is us and that we bring that value and we are part of this movement. So there are many parts of society, society where it has not been easy for women of color to break through what traditionally have been white uh, male dominated spaces. In the case of parks, as we discussed today, far too often there isn't even a space in the community for people to be part of. So we need to make sure as we develop these park spaces, we're doing it in a culturally competent way that fits the vision of the community. It, go, it goes back a little bit to the previous question on displacement and making sure that we're creating park projects from the ground up. And to me, that also means um, hiring park staff from the local community. Again, seeing people um, that you know or are like you, you know, at parks as well. It also means including art uh, to give a voice both to um, a voice in the community and creating a sense of place uh, that's welcoming or uh, making sure that we are providing that permit so uh, you know the local uh, tamale guy can stay and uh, you know sell in the park and still support his business so we have to make them part of the plan not an afterthought and these are the kinds of opportunities that excite me um, we have the potential to fund trans uh, um, for med, uh, transformational really park projects that allow everyone in the community to show up as the best version of themselves. So, so thank you Teresa for sharing and, and we all uh, got to do our part to make sure we see more uh, folks like us at the table, um, but then preserving our culture uh, when these are built. So thank you for, for that question. Congresswoman Maragan, muchas gracias. We have to give you a big virtual Abrazo for being with us today. Thank you so, so much. Um, thank you for the opportunity that the Outdoors for All Act will bring to communities like Las Cruces, uh, like Sacramento, uh, and certainly your communities there in Los Angeles uh, to have more access to the green spaces uh, where the elote vendor is still allowed 
to be on the side of the park and where we can have culture, where we can have meaningful experiences um, for all communities to enjoy these green spaces that are so, so important to us in urban settings. Uh, Congressista, I know you have to be out for a vote here very soon and you're gonna run to the house floor. Um, so thank you again so much. Uh, I really appreciate you being with us uh, on this panel. Thank you so much. Take care. Hasta luego. Hasta luego. All right, well, we have now another special guest that just joined us just in time. Um, he is the senior senator from New Mexico um, and has been one of the most steadfast allies when it comes to creating access and opportunity for all people, but especially uh, rural, uh, urban, and tribal underserved communities. Um, senator Heinrich is a champion of the Outdoor Future Initiative, which to this point has been um, really a vision by people of color with lived experiences trying to create a federal model for how we actually get more of our young people outdoors having these transformational experiences in a very real way. And I'm proud to say that Senator Heinrich is a huge supporter of that. And with that, I will go ahead and let the Senator introduce himself. Welcome, Senator. Good morning and thanks, Gabe. Uh, and thank you to everyone from the Outdoor Future Alliance, uh, from the Outdoor Alliance and from Outdoor Future for offering up this opportunity to have a discussion this morning. Um, it's no secret how much fighting for conservation and new opportunities on our public lands really drives me in my work here in the Senate. You know, I grew up exploring the outdoors on my family's small ranch and the surrounding lands in rural Missouri. And when I came out to New Mexico after college, I had the opportunity to work on really large expanses of public lands in New Mexico and Arizona as an AmeriCorps member for the, for the US Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, that really led to a huge change for me away from engineering. Um, I went on to run a small experiential education nonprofit called Cottonwood Gulch Expeditions that takes youth on backcountry uh, trips into landscapes all across the Southwest. And in that experience, I saw time and time again, just how dramatically getting outside can change a child's whole worldview. Uh, it really can inspire a lifetime of commitment to conservation and meaningful connection to place. Getting outdoors encourages kids to just have a healthier lifestyle. And my wife, Julie, and I have tried to raise our two boys getting outside for trips on our public lands. Um, and I have to say, like, sometimes, you know, sometimes it's hard to remember what we voted on last week around here, but the memories from those trips, I can recite almost every one of those trips for the last decade, um, like it was yesterday. Um, but outdoor excursions that, that many of us, including myself, can take for granted are just not always within reach for everyone. And while the livelihoods of people of color have long been rooted in the outdoors, they haven't always had equitable access to public lands and the outdoors. Uh, in New Mexico, outdoor equity advocates and community leaders led the way in breaking down some of these barriers with the creation of the first of its kind, and I'm very proud of that, uh, outdoor equity fund. California's followed suit. Uh, and now the work continues with the Outdoor Future Initiative, uh, an effort that I am very proud to support. Uh, the truth is there are far too many kids who don't have easy access to parks, to open spaces, or, or really to any outdoor friendly spaces near their homes. On top of just physical accessibility, many children grow up in households where their parents can't afford a vacation or they may feel unsafe in these public parks and spaces. Outdoor opportunities should be accessible to all Americans, regardless of wealth, where you grow up or the color of your skin. Uh, I, I strongly believe that access to the outdoors is a fundamental human right. And we need to devote real resources to expanding opportunities for those in communities who have been historically excluded from outdoor experiences. I'm really thrilled to be working with all of you at Outdoor Future. Um, this is a powerful national group of leaders from all sorts of diverse backgrounds and communities on this work at the national level. We need to build on our recent historic victories for things like the Great American Outdoors Act, 
that make our parks and public lands uh, places everyone, literally everyone from every zip code can enjoy. And I am committed to working with Outdoor Future uh, to introduce legislation later this year to address barriers in access to our public lands and provide new opportunities for kids from communities of color to engage in outdoor recreation. Uh, hearing the perspectives of all these great panelists who are leading this work is incredibly important. And, and I hope you'll all keep thinking of me as an ally and a partner in making our public lands live up to their full potential, their full promise as places that we all own and love. Uh, so thanks for doing this today. And uh, thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much, Senator, for those wonderful words um, and for your, your work in, in the Senate on these issues and on so many other issues important uh, to Latino communities, especially as we celebrate Latino Conservation Week. Uh, you know, the Outdoor Alliance represents um, members that all engage in human powered outdoor pursuits, kayaking and climbing and paddling, um, bicycling. And the Outdoor Equity Fund in New Mexico um, has actually helped to create new programs for underserved youth to do all of those amazing activities uh, from fly fishing to kayaking uh, to just last week when I got a call uh, from a prospective applicant for this year's fund that wanted to start a climbing program um, for dreamers and for folks with undocumented status as a way for them to deal with the impacts of their, the, the mental health impacts that they have yeah. regarding their immigration status. And, and so uh, that is the transformational power of the New Mexico Outdoor Equity Fund and the Outdoor Future Initiative seeks to actually provide that at a national level to a multitude of states, to rural, urban and tribal communities. And that's just one example um, of the applicants this year. We've had so many more, um, including uh, a native bike shop in Albuquerque, New Mexico, uh, that is teaching youth about uh, native plant life in the bosque by taking them on rides across the bosque canals um, as a way to reintroduce culture and traditional uh, learning um, and medicine uh, uh, gathering in, in a place like Albuquerque. And so uh, the, the, the future is, is really bright with, um, with folks like you behind these efforts. So thank you. Uh, with that, I wanna go ahead and pass it on uh, to Ms. Teresa Martinez, uh, who has a question for you, Senator, thank you. Good morning, Senator Heinrich. Um, it's good to see you. <laughs> like we've all been seeing a lot of each other lately. It's all good. Um, but you did mention something about that. You know, you see yourself as an ally, and I think most recently, um, and actually, Gabacha penned this piece in the Outdoor Business Journal about, you know, your allyship and and how you show up in this community with our community side by side. And um, and I I think something you said actually, we were at an event. Uh, Friday night, and you said something where, you know, you can't do anything big alone, and I think you're absolutely correct. It's something I say all the time, that this is a we, not a me, an us, not an I, and I think when we think about allyship, especially in today's climate, you know, we had a huge event last year, George Floyd's murder, Breonna Taylor's murder, all of these things that have really exposed to us the pain and trauma that exists in our communities of color. We all could tell our own stories of microaggressions that over time build up and create pain and trauma. And so when we show up in these spaces, and, and, and for me personally, you know, I've been privileged that many of my mentors have been white males and who have given me amazing confidence and space to be able to be who I am and, and saw more of me than I saw myself to be where I am today. So I'm very privileged that I can see the positive sides of allyship. Um, I know a lot of people have not seen that side of it, but I think from your perspective, um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll also say that I think one of the things that we need to figure out how to do in this moment is now that we can start to recognize and acknowledge all the pain and trauma that people are experiencing in these spaces, we still have to figure out how to move forward. Like we can't get caught up too much in the pain and trauma. Like there's a lot of work that needs to be done. We have to acknowledge that. Um, but we also need to move. Time can't wait. Climate can't wait. Our planet can't wait. Our country can't wait. The Continental Divide Trail, the Continental Divide itself, the watersheds cannot wait for us to figure all of it out. And so it's not gonna be perfect. We're gonna continue to make mistakes. But I wonder how you see that in your work with the Outdoor Future, the work you do across the state of New Mexico, which is a, such a unique community 
in the state with such different com uh, communities of color and, and various other histories, especially in our indigenous communities, how you see we move this space forward together as an ally and um, how you might see how we can continue to show up together in this space and begin the healing as well as while at the same time we do the work. Yeah, I, I think you raise a great point that we need to be doing multiple things at the same time, but to be able to do some of that conservation work, you just can't, you can't effectively do it if you're not also listening to some very difficult experiences, um, recognizing the inequity of our history and, and having those conversations and those listening sessions at the same time as that informs um, how we put together coalitions that really have all of us at the table. Um, because frankly, we can't get the big things done. Uh, the scale of the challenge in front of us right now, whether it's, um, whether it's our landscapes, whether it's climate change and biodiversity, all of those things are really big problems, too big for any group to solve by themselves. And so if we're going to put together effective coalitions, we have to have equitable tables with all of these communities around the table listening to each other, even when that's hard. And so I think it's incumbent upon us to really realize that these things can't be split apart, that they, they really are connected. And if we do that, you know, I think I might have mentioned at the um, at the event on, on Friday night for uh, Latino Outdoors Week that it, we've seen how to do this wrong. I mean, we did it many times and we know how to get it wrong and how to fail. And we've also seen great examples. And I'm proud that New Mexico has been at the forefront of a lot of those examples of how to get it right. And so we need to we need to invest the time and the space to to get it right. Thank you so much, Senator. Thank you, Teresa, for that wonderful question. Uh, absolutely, I think the benefit of uh, getting youth in, in, in the outdoors, and, and I remember in New Mexico that there was a lot of skeptics about the Outdoor Equity Fund, especially in the state legislature, yep. um, that didn't understand why it was important for youth to have these experiences um, in places like uh, the Gila National Forest or the Carson National Forest or the Lincoln National Forest or the high deserts um, of uh, the Jorgen Mountain Desert Peaks National Monument. In fact, I remember hearing from one senator who said, if kids wanna go outdoors, why don't they just open their back door and go outside? And I think for folks that have the privilege to be in conservation minded careers, and we've seen the makeup of the workforce of, of our land management. Right that this is true, but it's not representative of our country. Uh, it's not just going outside to your backyard, if you even have the privilege of going to, the, uh, to your backyard, if you have a backyard, but it's turning over stones and crawfish, right? It's um, understanding what the difference between cold water uh, and warm water fishing, uh, fish species are. It's seeing a pronghorn on the you know, plains um, of Southern New Mexico and just wondering about these you know, beautiful mammals that exist in this state and uh, trying to get trying to understand their biology and their habits that lead to these thoughts about conservation, about careers working outdoors, um, so that we can have more of a diversified workforce and people who will take care of our climate and our, and our environment in the future. And, and that's what this fund seeks to do. Um, with that, I want to pass on the next question to Ms. Gavacha. I wonder. Muchas gracias, Gabe. Um, Senator, it's nice to see you again <laughs> so soon. Um, again, thank you for your service and all the support you've provided so far for the Outdoor Future Initiative. Um, for me growing up, the outdoors were not really separate from life. My dad has always been a hunter and a fisherman and so much of what we did as a family revolved around spending time, whether it be the ocean or the river or tracking wildlife in the monte. Um, and today I recognize that this proximity to nature and the opportunities that I have always had to interact with it in these tangible and meaningful ways has really helped me develop this empathy and care for our resources, um, but also build character and confidence to face life challenges. And I think most importantly, really helped me understand how my mental health is positively affected by that proximity to nature. 
And it, it really is, it's not just a, a joy, it's a necessity, right, for, for my well-being. And you, sir, are a father of two. And I'm curious to hear how, how has the outdoors impacted your own children? And why is it important to you through the New Mexico Outdoor Equity Fund locally and then through the outdoor future nationally that more children have access to these meaningful outdoor experiences? Yeah, my, my experience is both with my sons, Carter and Micah, and also at Cottonwood Gulch Expeditions just continually have reinforced to me that if we're not doing this with each and every child, then we're, we're not meeting our potential as, as a community and as a society. There, there's something about the kind of stimulation and the complexity of being outside that can never be replicated by an Xbox, um, that can never be replicated in an indoor environment that, that you know, we evolved in these spaces and they push buttons in our brains that no video game will ever be able to push. And it develops us into better leaders. And if we're, we're leaving whole communities of children out of that equation, um, then we're, we're really failing. Um, I, I remember my, uh, my oldest boy's first elk hunt and the, the focus he had at a time when, you know, he was maybe 12, 13 and, um, you know, normally would have been distracted oftentimes is, you know, a typical boy of that age. And for that, for hours in the, in the buildup to his first elk, how he was continually in the moment in a way that most of us would, could only hope for. Um, that's something that, all of us need to experience because it, it, frankly, it brings out the human in us in a way that many of our environments don't. Thank you, Senator. Thank you so much for, uh, for that. And um, your boys will, gosh, they will benefit, reap the benefits of experiences and passing those down uh, to them, uh, I'm sure will lead them, whether it's conservation or any other work uh, where they will appreciate and and, and you know, support policies and support actions and support leaders who are trying to protect our special places, our wildlife, our natural resources. And that's also a really important part of that equation as well, uh, is to create a, a generation of people uh, who care about things like climate change and conservation. Gabe, my, my oldest uh, son Carter is literally spending this summer working for the city of Albuquerque's Outdoor Recreation Division, introducing kids to these activities. Amazing, amazing. Well, give him a big thank you um, on all our behalf for, for doing that. Um, we need more mentors like that. So thank you, Senator. Uh, and then I'll pass it on now to, I'm going to call him El Profesor Gonzalez because he's looking very academic over here. Uh, he's a good friend. He's a founder of Latino Outdoors and um, uh, has been involved in introducing um, young people to the outdoors uh, for many, many years. So Jose, I'll kick it off to you. Gracias. Gracias, Gabe, and buenos dias, uh, Senator Heinrich. Uh, I appreciate you sharing a bit of your background around environmental experiential education. That's part of my work as well, especially working with migrant youth uh, throughout California uh, and understand both the joys and challenges um, of doing all of that work. And I wanted to share a little bit and then ask a question around this that, that you've kind of referred to a little bit. So I've had the privilege and benefit of working, um, doing work in support of agencies, uh, both state and national level, uh, National Park Service, Fish and Wildlife Service, as well as in community with my colegas in organizations like Nuestra Tierra. Um, and it's the work through that, not just that I've obviously gotten to appreciate my current home state of California, even though I'm an immigrant from Mexico, I still, California is still uh, a huge component of my home. But I've also come to experience, appreciate, and admire like the landed beauty of New Mexico, uh, which in many ways becomes a second home. And everything from obviously the majestic landscapes that are the, the National Monument of the Oregon Mountains, um, and as well as the more cruising spaces for myself, El Bosque and Albuquerque, I'm still making my stop at Varelas for some Chile. Uh, no offense to my Colorado colleagues. And of course, the landed <laughs> history. Yeah, the landed history of like... Thank you, Jose. That means a lot. <laughs> okay, yeah, just saying. 
I'll, I'll get the messages later, I'm sure. Um, but also just, the, you know, as, as a, my undergrad was in history, appreciating all the history of New Mexico, including, including Tierra Amarilla and a lot of Northern Mexico. So there's just um, a, lot of, a, a lot of gratitude, such that I joke that a place like Las Cruces is a, is a home that I didn't know I had. Um, it's one of those types of places. And uh, my question gets to be that apart from this, just this landed beauty of New Mexico, it also has all the elements in terms of the variety and diversity of communities that need to be a critical aspect of this work, right? As we're talking, quote unquote, the outdoor future, it is rural, tribal, range of Hispano and Latinx community, like New Mexico has all of those elements. Um, and as that is being pushed, of course, you also face the challenges of resource extraction and so forth. So thinking about this is what do you wanna be able to say in, in how New Mexico is approaching this? Um, and as it's getting it right, how, is, how important it is, is that as a model for nationwide impact as well, of course, of course as a model for other states? Well, I, I'm really proud of what we've been able to do so far, but at the same time, we're just beginning. And there is, you know, New Mexico has a longer history even than many of the states in the East that we think of as the, you know, the original colonies. And it's a complex, rich history. And that's, that's our strength. Um, but it also, you know, if, if you read that history, if you study that history, you just realize how, how in incredibly traumatic and challenging it has been for all of these communities over time. And so I, I think it's, it's if we can if we can create models in New Mexico that change our future in positive ways that diversify our economy that reinvest in rural communities that you know one of our I think if we can come up with models where kids growing up in a rural community like Cuesta end up being the local forest service ranger and working in the woods on um, on thinning projects and on watershed restoration or working for New Mexico Game and Fish as a, uh, as a patrolman, as a law enforcement officer. Those, if, if we can do that in New Mexico as complex and traumatic and confrontational as our history has been, we can do it anywhere. And, and so, you know, I think we're really blessed with an enormous, amount of talent uh, and leadership, many of which are on this call right now. And, and if you look around my state, it's, it's the, the breadth of that right now is really incredible. So we have an opportunity to set a die that won't be a one for one with any other place in the country, but will be a good, a good lodestone to sort of look at and say, um, from a process point of view, how did you do it there? and learn from that and then take it to, to your local community um, in, in a way that is respectful of the, the local communities wherever you are. Thank you, Senator. Thank you for that question, Jose. I am so proud of, of the work we've done in Nuevo Mexico. And as the Senator mentioned, it, it, um, we made a very intentional decision when working on the New Mexico Outdoor Equity Fund to make sure that dollars weren't just gonna be equitably distributed um, in, in urban communities like Albuquerque or Las Cruces or Santa Fe, but that dollars and applicants um, from all of our Pueblo and tribal nations in the state um, also flow to those communities. And conversely, that the poor, that there's many other uh, underserved rural communities and places like Southeast New Mexico, from, Co from Hobbs to Clovis uh, to Carlsberg, that, that have their own outdoor programs and their own communities of underserved youth that come in cultures and experiences and backgrounds and ways that they interact uh, with the outdoors. And so the outdoor really seeks to capitalize on that by creating a system of uh, opportunity through funding, you know, through, through eventual funding that reaches states like Georgia and Alabama and Mississippi and New Mexico and California. That's very hard to do because we're a very diverse country, but there's something in it for everybody in the Outdoor Future Initiative. And that's one of the, that's one of the reasons that this particular effort 
uh, really gives me hope because if you are um, you know, a young kid in Mississippi or you are um, a young person in Maine, uh, there will be something in this fund for you in the outdoors um, and for local organizations and local governments and tribes from Florida all the way up to Oregon, right? And so uh, we are so hopeful that this is the right. Um, and with Senator Heinrich's leadership, I think we're gonna get there. Um, I do just wanna quickly, as we have about four minutes left, um, acknowledge that we have had some questions in the chat box. Um, I am not sure that we'll be able to get to all of them, so I very much apologize. Uh, but Katie, perhaps we can take some of these questions if we have the information for folks who have registered uh, and get back to these folks after our webinars. I know the Senator uh, does have to run. Um, I, will, I will take one question uh, before, we, before we leave, um, and then I'll close this off with some final comments. And uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and um, take this question from, um, from Kenneth Coppins. It's a question for you, Senator. Uh, this is around the Recreation Not Red Tape Act and the Simplifying the Outdoor Access to Recreation or the Stract. Um, do you think one or both? You cut out there, but I think you're asking what the prospects for those are in this Congress? Yes. I, I yes. think... Um, I think they're 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 bright for getting something across the finish line, and I I believe that we'll be able to reconcile the two approaches uh, in a way that is complementary. Uh, I have you know a really good relationship with Senator Wyden, who has a slightly different approach than what we put together, but um, I I think it's an opportunity to really unite those two things, get something across the finish line and make it so much easier for small businesses to have the, the long-term certainty that they need. Uh, you know, I used to do that work. I was a nonprofit, but people think nonprofits don't have to, you know, you have to balance the books every year. And there are dozens of people who are relying on you for their income. So the fact that in a given year, I remember one year I was getting ready to um, trying to get the permit for the Cibola National Forest that my organization had had every year for decades. And they were like, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, we don't have time to process that this year. Um, we're, we're busy on a land swap, we've got other priorities. And I'm like, what, well, we can't take a year off, you know, or say there's a wildfire in one place and you need the flexibility to be able to change your, your geographic part of your plan. We need to make the, the, the national uh, agencies that steward these lands for all of us responsive to the fact that having those, all those nonprofits and small businesses as part of this ecosystem is really capacity for them and, and it protects our landscapes and it needs to be much more responsive and there needs to be a lot less red tape. So I'm optimistic and I think we will get those things across the finish line and hopefully we'll be able to reap the rewards in our communities and our, in our economic health. Thank you, Senator. Uh, and thank you so much for your work on that as well. Uh, th these pieces of legislation are all part of the equation to create access and opportunity. And as you mentioned, uh, nonprofits and other institutions that need access to public lands to be able to just engage in these programmatic activities with youth is dependent on them getting permits. So this is certainly part of the puzzle of what we're all collectively trying to do. Um, I wanna close this out by just saying thank you so much to the Outdoor Alliance. Thank you to Katie, uh, to Adam, uh, to Tanya for helping to organize this from the OA crew and the OA California uh, folks. Um, again, Teresa, Jose, Gawacha, thank you all so much. Uh, the Outdoor Future Initiative is going to need your support support of your neighbors, support of your friends, and certainly the support of your respective people in Congress. And so please visit the outdoorfuture.org website. There will be a call to action that will be put in the chat by uh, the Outdoor Alliance folks that we would like to ask you to please take action to support this effort now. And as this legislation uh, is introduced in the near future, uh, we hope to keep you updated but you have to sign on to the um, Outdoor uh, Future Initiative newsletter by going to the website and signing up. And from there, I just wanna say muchas gracias again during the middle of Latino Conservation Week. What an amazing effort to highlight. And Senator, thank you so, so much for all your work that you're doing on behalf of not just New Mexico, but the whole country.
Hasta luego. Thank you all.